Jordan. Hello, everybody. I'm so glad you guys are here. For those that are watching me for the first time, this is Latifad, aka Money Fit MD. I'm a GI doc. I'm also a money and mindset coach, which means that I want you to have money. So if I want you to have money, there are many ways we can do that. But today, I'm bringing someone incredibly amazing, and you will know that once you talk to her. We've been chatting for about 30 minutes now, and we have to just like press record because we need to do this <laughs> stuff. But Elaine is a fabulous woman. She's a human. She's a mom. She's a physician. She's a neurologist. She's also a real estate investor. And my goal for today is that she would just come here and bless you guys with her amazing knowledge on how to go from wherever you are to creating wealth for yourself using real estate as a vehicle. So Elaine, welcome to our show. Awesome. Yeah, thank you for having me. I'm so excited to be here. It's been fun uh, hanging out with you before, re before recording this. And I just love that you're creating a space for people to be an example of what is possible. So as we talk through um, my journey, you're gonna hear that theme over and over and over again, that the, the human mind is amazing and can do so much, but we can do so much when it's already been modeled for us. And we can say, hey, when you walk into a store, everyone walks up to the cash register and pays. That must be what I have to do. Or, hey, that person has had that success in business or real estate. I bet I could do that. And so I love that you're creating this space where we can be an example of what's possible for each other. No, thank you for saying that. So for you guys that are listening, Elaine is remarkable in a lot of ways. But there's something even more incredibly special about her is the fact that she started investing in real estate as a resident. I mean, I don't know about y'all, but when I was a resident, I did not know where my feet was. I'm like, <laughs> what the heck is a 401k? I had none. I had nothing. I was living worse than paycheck to paycheck. So can you like for you, was there an example of what was possible in that regard for you? Yeah, Absolutely. So going back even before my journey and my medical training, um, both my husband and I grew up in very poor families. Um, we both were emancipated during our teenage years. So we were legally responsible for ourselves you know, at a very young age. And when we met each other, that, you know, that came up on our first date. It was clear that there was like a soul connection there. And I, I mentioned that to say that you people can learn from example. They can also learn by an example of what not to do. So we learned at a very young age what we didn't want for ourselves. We didn't want to have to struggle with money or have bill collectors or have the stress that we saw our parents. My husband struggled with homelessness for a while. Um, we wanted to be able to do things. We, we, didn't, we knew what it was like as kids to, to hear, oh, we can't do that. I mean, I'm talking like simple things like you can't have you know, clothes for school, not things like, oh, you can't go to the amusement park. We knew that we wanted something different for ourselves as adults and then eventually um, for ourselves as parents and generational wealth. Um, and so early on in our, in our early 20s, when we were kind of forming our identities as adults, we looked to the people around us that we saw who were living lives that we wanted to emulate. And we would come back together and say, um, it seems like all of these people who don't know each other, who were connected to differently, one of them, I was like the nanny of their family. Another was someone that my husband did some like IT consulting with. They all were invested in real estate. Mm. And so we very quickly saw, oh, here's the pattern. These people have successful jobs, successful businesses, um, attorneys, physicians, all sorts of careers. Um, but they're all invested in real estate. And that's the common denominator of these families that we look at and we think that's who we want to be. And we were just lucky that we were able to have that influence in our very early 20s, kind of coupled with that fire of our childhood of something has to be different for us. Wow, that's, that's, I mean, I got goosebumps. Thanks for sharing that story <laughs> with us. And it also reminds me of the impact of being understanding that you don't know who is around you. So a lot of what I talk about is building financial legacy for women physicians and empowering each other when it comes to money. For you, you were the nanny and you mm -hmm. were able to see the people that you were working for and you borrowed things from them mindset wise, mm -hmm. example wise, that has helped you create this life for you. So, yeah. I mean, I were just talking about the fact that I just hired an assistant, which guys, I'm super excited about this. 
But, you know, she is a fantastic lady. She shares my goal for helping women physicians. But this may be her first insight into learning about money and the psychology mm-hmm, of mm-hmm. success. So I told her, listen, your goal is to help, but your goal is also to grow so that you can create wealth. So what you just said right now about you as the nanny learning from the people that you were around, just that really st- struck a chord for me. So thanks for sharing yeah, that. Yeah. So where did that, that journey take you? Yes, go ahead. Yeah. So I I was going to say, you know, we're all learning from the people who are ahead of us, but we're also examples to the people that we can, that can learn from us and saw this beautiful circle of of knowledge and inspiration uh, going around. Um, So very, very tactically, um, when my husband and I got married, um, I I had just applied to medical school and um, I owned a home and he owned a home and we rented out my home. I was a very reluctant landlord. I wanted to sell that home. I mean, we had just gotten married. We were going to medical, I was going to medical school. I was leaving my job to do so. We were hoping for a baby. And I thought, gosh, the last thing we need now is two houses. We just need the one. And um, it was right after the crash, this was in 2011. And so the market was such that it would have been very challenging to sell that property. And so I very reluctantly went into being a landlord for that property and we self-managed. It was just like two miles from the home that my husband and I were living in um, and learned that I really loved it. Learned that not only could I see that mortgage balance going down because the tenants were paying the rent and I was using that rent to pay the mortgage, but the value of that home was creeping back up as the economic recovery happened in the early 2010s and we were cash flowing. We did that for about two years. Um, and then when I was in my third year of medical school, we had saved up all of our money and we knew we had this, this vision of a real estate portfolio. And when I was in my third year of medical school, we bought our first rental property that was specifically to, to be an investment property. We um, bought a foreclosure that had been vacant for many, many years. It needed a full renovation. We hired out the things that we had to in terms of like HVAC, roof, things that were permitted work. But we went and did a lot of the labor ourselves. Um, That was just the kind of the stage of life we were in, what was available to us. And, um, you know, when I look back at that, um, it was hard work. I was like laying ceramic tile and painting and putting in light fixtures and all sorts of things. But it was also so fun. Um, I knew that I wouldn't be renovating houses forever. But that was that was all we could accomplish because we didn't have very much money. So we had to put in our own labor, Um, loved doing that process. Um, And then we were able to do a cash out refi of that project, kind of get that bucket of money back, used that to buy our next property and then basically have just continued that process all the way through. As we've become more experienced real estate investors, we've learned how to recycle our capital faster. you know, everything in, in life is leverage. Like you have hired this person to do some tasks for you so that you can leverage her time to accomplish more in your life. Money is another form of leverage. Um, and then we've just continued to grow the portfolio. So we're at about 22 million of assets that we personally own. Um, at this point, along the way, we created a property management company. Um, so we now manage about 45 million of assets overall, about half that we personally own and half that are owned by investors. And just, you know, I think of like the saying, like, start by starting, like if someone had told me the day we closed on that foreclosure in my third year of medical school, that about six years later, I would have 22 million of real estate assets. I would like, I would think they were on drugs. Smoking crack. (laughs) Like you just put one foot in front of the other. Um, A lot of it's mindset work. Um, I'm sure we'll get into that as we we go through the, the call here. Um, but just put one foot in front of the other and have a clear vision of, I I had a very clear vision of what I wanted for the future. I hope that everyone listening has a clear vision at at all different times. If you take one thing away from this call, it's what do you want your great grandchildren to think of you? Or if you're not going to have children, what's a, a charitable cause that you want or, or a legacy or nieces and nephews or something, but what, what do you want to be thought of you well after your death? What do you want to be happening the day you die? What do you want to be happening 10 years before you die, 20 years before you die? And then you just go all the way back until you're saying, what do I want my life to look like for the next few hours? And you just constantly are visioning a perfect life and then just walking toward it as best you can. I 
so much, so much to unpack there. So there were three things, well, there's like 5 million things, but there were three. <laughs> One of them is you said kind of knowing your why, mm -hmm. right? Knowing why you want to do what you want to do. Um, the second one you pointed out was the legacy, figuring mm -hmm. out what your legacy is, because a lot of times, right, no matter what we're trying to do, there's going to be fear, there's going to be bumps in the road, you may, most times you don't even know how, because if you knew how, you'd be doing it already, right? So you mm -hmm. may not know how, but when you have that idea of what legacy you want to build, and then the third one is just start by starting. Mm -hmm. Yep, yep, absolutely. But I'm curious, when you were doing the foreclosure, did you know how many doors you wanted? <laughs> no, no. And in fact, kind of all along, um, like I think if you asked at any given time, I set what I thought were ambitious goals and then we would hit them. And then I would like, or we would be getting close. And, and then I would say like, okay, well, we've done this. And it's like, it's not that bad. Surely we can do double that or, you know, surely we can do that. So I would say if I remember myself from all those years ago, I would have said we probably wanted maybe 10 doors or maybe 20. Our goal now is a, hundred, is a, a billion of assets uh, under management, which is just 50 times bigger than we are now, which you know, a billion sounds crazy. But then when you look at like the multiple, we have a whole lifetime to get there. Um, and so just kind of pushing that goalpost along and that dance of being excited by the goal, but also not being overwhelmed and knowing that at any point you can stop. Maybe it's three doors and it's a little bit to cover a kid's tuition in college or have a little extra spending money. And that's great and wonderful and lovely. Maybe it's a whole business. Maybe it's a franchises of business. Maybe it's being a fortune 500 company, who knows? Um, but having that dance of being excited about the future, but also knowing that you get to decide every day. I, I think a lot about The Alchemist, a, a very popular small novel of you can always go home. You can always change your mind. You can always change course. I think of the, the saying, um, plans are useless, but planning is everything. I so love being that. Open to you know, have a plan, have that vision. But then know that what will be will be. Maybe you have that plan of I want 10 doors by next year, but then someone gives you a call and says, I know of a 16 unit building that's for sale. I'd hope you wouldn't say, no, I only have a plan for 10. You'd say, yeah, tell me about it. Or maybe you have a plan for 10 and you get five and you think, wow, I really don't like this. I want to try something else. Or maybe I want to do passive investing. Or who knows? But do some goal setting, but also follow your heart. Um, and, you know, kind of a, a thing that I continually come back to in building my life, building my business, building our wealth is the idea that let's say the average listener is 40 years old. So our brains are 40 years old. We have 40 years of experience to go off of, but the universe or life or God or whoever you want to call that is like an infinite amount of time old. We don't know how old. We know that the universe is billions of years old. If mm -hmm. we're going to go with like a like an atheist perspective and just a science perspective, like is it possible that the universe has a bigger, better plan for us than we could ever envision with say our forty year old brains? I think so. I think that's very probable. And so planning with my human brain and all of the capacities that we have as humans but also being in this dance with the universe that there's a very good likelihood that this billions of years old universe or infinite time supreme being probably has a better plan for me, just being in relationship with that. I love that. It's that openness to the possibility and mm -hmm. being humble enough to know that your view, your thought of what big is could just be literally the tip of a That's bigger, right. I, like, you know, because a lot of times think about it when we're in residency or even med school, right? You're in first, you're like, this is so hard. I mm -hmm. would be so happy if I can just memorize a Krebs cycle. That's right. right? Yeah. And then That's you right. get to second, you're like, oh, Krebs cycle is easy, right? Yeah. I could just figure out how to like examine the heart and hear the heart rhythms or whatever. And then you're yeah. like, oh, that's easy. In fact, a lot of times when I look back at my life, I'm like, if I could take that test again, I would ace it. Yep. Yeah. Right? Because yeah. wherever we are right now, no matter where you are, you can only see the vision to the point where your view can go. But there's so much mm -hmm. more expense beyond that. You get there and yeah. you're like, oh, wow, there's more. 
there's more, there's more. Yeah. Right. I think that's the most beautiful thing about being a physician in terms of applying what we've learned as physicians to life or to money is that we can all remember ourselves as, and it go all the way back. Some people knew they wanted to be a doctor when they were in kindergarten, but maybe it wasn't kindergarten for you. Maybe it was a senior in high school or even a senior in college, but there was a day when if you had told any of us, you're gonna be running a service, seeing patients, responding to endless EMR, taking calls, answering pages, making decisions in 30 seconds, we, we would have died of panic attacks. And now we just do it. And so just having that, that, that training and that process where we became something that was seemingly impossible, I promise you, if we can do that in medicine, real estate and business is not human lives. No one dies. It's much simpler. <laughs> I, I completely agree. I am going to ask you, how did you become the person that's doing crazy-ish like that? <laughs> um, you know, just, just kind of everything I said there of um, kind of the mindset work. Some might maybe call that like a spiritual belief. I think it's I think it's more kind of mindset, but um, just believing that that things are possible, um, looking to people who have done the things that I want to do and either directly asking them, how did you do that? People love to talk about themselves. People will tell you. Or if I, it was someone I didn't have a relationship with or couldn't get a relationship with and just kind of watching them from afar as much as I could. Um, I would say, again, kind of getting back to tactics is I entered medical school a little bit later than my peers. So I finished undergrad and then I did a two-year master's degree and then I worked for two years. So I was four years older than my peers. I had just gotten married and I knew I wanted to have children. And so I think I entered medical school a little bit of a different place than maybe someone who came in like straight after college. And so I was able to kind of keep myself out of this belief of, after training or after medical school or after medical school or after training and even going back, right? I was emancipated at 16. So I was an adult at 16. I couldn't even think of things of like, well, after high school, I just had to live my adult life. And I think that that mindset was very healthy for me and that it allowed me to say like, well, of course I'm going to buy a rental property while I'm in medical school. Why wouldn't I? I see other people in their twenties buying rental properties. I can do it too. And I didn't get sucked into that idea of I have to postpone certain things, postpone, and not just business, but maybe someone wants to get married and they want to postpone it until after a certain milestone or wants to have a child or, you know, whatever. Um, obviously, there are major commitments that come with medical school and residency, and we lose a lot of our ability to control our time and that sort of thing, but we don't lose the ability to control our mindset and keeping a mindset of, I can still be the whole perfect person I want to be while I'm in this very rigorous training and reach other goals, do the things I want to do. I think if I had to pick like one thing that allowed me to accomplish my real estate goals while I was in training, it would be having that mindset. That's powerful. And I a hundred percent agree with you that I think that one thing that's missing, well, there are things, other things that are missing are medical education training, but that mindset training is missing. And I'm really, really glad and happy to see that a lot of people are working to help us get that more into people early so that mm -hmm. we're not waiting. There's that delayed gratification. And I, I go through that when I'm coaching people with money as well, where it's like, well, I'll be happy when, or after this, this, right? after this thing, I can have that. And then we get there and number one, it may not be as glamorous as you thought it was going to be. And you've mm -hmm. now delayed your entire life. And you're like, was that even worth it? That's right. right. So I That's love right. that idea of you have to be in the present. You have to think about the future. You have to think of your legacy, have a why, have a plan, but it, it doesn't have to be either or it can be both mm -hmm. in That's terms right. of living that life a little bit. Yeah. One thing I also wanted to talk to you about is, and I've talked a lot on my platform about how one of the fears that I had before I started was the fear of success. 
-hmm. And I find that that's very, very common with women where there's that fear of what's going to happen when I have this? What if I own 50 doors? That sounds scary. 100 Mm -hmm. doors, that sounds scary. So can you talk to me a little bit about the fear of success? And if that's something that ever came up for you throughout this journey? Oh yeah. Every day. Like I I would say if there's one thing that I struggle with the most, it's this, um, you know, I, I think about growing our portfolio. We have a property management company now, so we have a payroll, we have staff that we're responsible for, um, all of the responsibilities that, that go with that. And I'd be lying if I say there weren't days that I'm very nervous about that, about the, I I think of like the feeling of overwhelm, that things are going to get too complicated. Like, the, the thing I will say, will say to myself is, aren't I building this so that I have freedom, which implies that as I build this bigger business and this bigger rental portfolio and more money, I'm going to have less freedom. So first I have to remind myself that that's a lie that my mind is telling me and that plenty of people have very nice lives. I think of like Barack Obama is someone I think about when I'm in that state. I'm like, it seems like he has a pretty nice life and he ran the country. So if he can do that, I can probably run a real estate company. Think of whoever is doing something really amazing that you're inspired by and like channel that energy. Um, and, and I think about, so one of the things that I work on with my own coach that has been very helpful is envisioning a future version of myself. So it's a little bit different than planning, um, a little bit different than even like sitting down and writing a vivid vision, but when I feel that sense of overwhelm of this is too hard or things are getting too complicated or, you know, more success, more problems. Like there's a song, right? Like more money, more problems. Like it's in the culture. When I find myself in that place, I'm a work in progress, but something that has been very helpful for me is saying, can I envision a future vision of myself that has the net worth goals that I have, or that has the cash flow goals that I have, or that's running the company of my dreams, or has the real estate portfolio of my dreams, even for one second, even if it's just so fleeting that I feel it, and then my mind instantly says, but no, or but this, because if you can feel something for one second, then it's real, then it's possible. And then just kind of leaning into that. Well, can I feel it for two seconds? Can I feel it for five seconds? Can I feel it for an hour? Can I say, you know, there will be a day that I'll have this and I will be fine. I'll, I'll have, I'll continue to have um, the mindset that I want, the life that I want, the ease that I want. Because um, I think our brains, we're human, right? We, we get caught up in, um, we want to stay in the status quo, even if the status quo is painful because change is hard and big change is really hard. And even if let's say we're struggling with debt or not being able to reach our money goals right now, and we think, oh, I have these money goals, the human mind will say, you almost sort of like better the devil you know than the devil you don't. Like just stay in this misery Mm -hmm. instead of going to this potential future misery. What is this possibility that the future isn't miserable, that it opens more opportunities, that it opens more connections, that it opens more ideas to collaborate or to do cool things in business or to have more freedom or to have more vacations or to provide more for your family. And just reminding your human mind, like you just stay quiet. I make the decisions Mm -hmm. and it's a dance I do every single day. So yes, that is something I struggle with and I, I totally get it. Those are some of the things that have helped me. (laughs) I I think it's interesting you bring that up. I use that quite a lot. And I actually use it very, very regularly, even in the small things. I'll Mm -hmm. give you an example. I was um, doing a planning a program that I was running like a group program. And the question I was, I was like, should I do a challenge? Should I do a mastermind? Should I do a webinar? And then I said, what would that person that has achieved the goal that I want, what would she Mm -hmm. tell me? And Mm -hmm. that person is my mentor, which is me in future. She literally rolled her eyes at me and she was like, girl, do both. (laughs) Or just make a decision and just pick one and see if you like it. And then if you don't like that, pick the other. Yep. And she was like, no, do both. All I right. want you to do both. Right. Like she would do. And it was such an easy decision because literally she rolled her eyes at me. And I was like, why are you even asking? Yeah, They're both great beautiful. ideas a month apart to both. I was like, sure, beautiful. done, yeah. Run, yeah. right? 
So commune with your future self as much as possible and commune with your past self as much as possible. And one thing, you know, my, my coach has, has taught me is to have grace for my past self. Um, that my past self, even if maybe I didn't agree with every decision she made, or I said, why didn't, why wouldn't I have done that or been afraid to do that or, you know, whatever. She's the one that brought me here that to this beautiful life I have with this beautiful business and beautiful marriage and beautiful family and like really quite like living the life of my dreams. And if I live in judgment of myself, then I won't be able to create my future self. But if I live in grace and love of my past self, then the future self will just find her way. Just kind of having that dance of present in the moment, loving the past, being grateful and excited about the future. I love that. I love that. And it's about, you know, people call it having your own back. Just mm -hmm. forgive, you know, you did the best with the information you have. Now you know better or now mm -hmm. you know different than do different. Mm -hmm. so I mm -hmm. love that. Yeah. So for the physicians you work with right now, because you have your own portfolio, you have your own property management, but you also do other stuff to help physicians create wealth through real estate. Tell us about that. Yeah. So a lot of physicians want to do active real estate investing. I love active real estate investing. I think it's a great way to have cash flow, debt pay down, um, appreciation of the property and tax benefits. And so for those folks, I, my property management company helps them to find a property. My husband's a licensed real estate agent. We have several real estate agents on our team. We help them find a property, um, do any renovations that are needed, place a tenant, manage it all the way through. And then at some future time in the, in the future, sell that property and, and reap those gains. Um, about half of our portfolio overall is owned by other investors. So half of it we own, half of it is, is owned by other investors and our property management company manages all of it. We also do that same structure with larger assets. Like we have a, a townhome community of uh, 30 townhomes um, that five investors are together on. And I think in the future, we're gonna continue to do more of those larger deals. Passive investing is also a really good option for physicians, particularly someone that maybe has money goals, but isn't super interested in real estate, which is totally okay. Like we can't all be interested in everything, but maybe someone wants to diversify out of their stock portfolio or their retirement accounts. And so passive investing are things like promissory notes, joint ventures, syndications, and it's typically um, people bringing capital together with an experienced partner who finds the deal, runs the deal, and then everyone benefits from that together. Um, so like a, um, a syndication is a very common example. So maybe let's say 100 people each bring $50,000, they use that as the down payment for a large asset. The general partners uh, operate the day-to-day -day management of the apartment complex. And then there's cash flow that's given to the investors all the way through. And then when it's sold, then any of the equity that's created is given to all of the investors. Very, very passive after vetting the sponsor, vetting the deal. It's basically just kind of set it and forget it, no active involvement in the deal. That's a great thing for physicians because we're high income earners, maybe with not a lot of time. And then if you couple not a lot of time with some folks don't have a lot of interest in real estate investing, it can be a way to get growth of your money and passive income without having to go the active route. And we do the passive deals as well. And you and your husband and your company, I would say, are a sponsor, correct? So we haven't done a syndication in the past, um, but we have deals lined up in the future for syndication. Yep. That's fantastic. That's fantastic. Yeah. And how many, <clears throat> you work with physicians and non-physicians, correct? That's right. Yep. Okay. Because most of my audience are physicians, women physicians. I do mm -hmm. have some non-physicians that sometimes would send me messages and go, but what about <laughs> us? Yeah. So if you're a non-physician and you're looking to grow your real estate investment, either actively or passively. And it sounds like you have something for everybody. I think so. So that's what we, that's what we've tried to create is um, if someone has like a small amount of capital and they want it to be passive, we can do like a promissory note where they lend money to us and we pay an interest rate. 
Um, if someone wants to own a property, we can help them acquire a property and then manage it. If someone wants to do a larger deal through like a syndication or a joint venture structure, we're able to do that. And as we, you know, as we've grown our business, we just look to what the needs of the people around us are. And I think you hit the nail on the head of finding what are the different needs that different people have and how can we create something where we can meet as many of those needs as possible. So if I was interested in working with you, how do I do that? How do I go about reaching out to you, connecting with you? Because you have a solution that a lot of people need. Yeah, thank, thank you for asking. Um, so we have a, a website, it's blackswan.realestate. Um, you can sign up there for our newsletter as well. Um, we have a very active Facebook group, Single Family at Scale. That's where we focus on single family investments. That's not all of what we do, but I find that that's a really good starting place for people. Um, and that's also just a way to stay connected and ask real estate questions and you'll get answers from us and from the community. Um, and then um, if, you've, if you want to contact us directly, you can find our email and phone number on our website and connect with us that way. Fantastic. So, I mean, we could literally go on forever because there's so much more that we could learn from you. I guess I we have to do this again sometime. <laughs> <laughs> it, would, it would be my pleasure. I, I, I think it's fun to, to talk about if I, if I had to end with, with one thing um, that I, I think would be a, a powerful message for people listening. Um, so I have lived through a wide expanse of uh, the socioeconomic scale. I've been very, very, very poor. And now I would consider myself to be fairly wealthy. And all along I had ideas of, um, well, maybe I should stop or maybe I have enough or wanting more money is greedy or dirty or you know, whatever negative thing you can think about. And I heard something a few years ago that was really powerful to me. And it's that, first of all, money is easy and money is fun. But living a really big life and being able to contribute and to really have a big impact often requires a lot of money. Not always. There are great examples, Mother Teresa, those sorts of things. But having a lot of money is not a bad thing. It's a, and, and using it as a vehicle to contribute um, can be so powerful. And so building wealth, it, it, I, I think of a, another phrase of, um, first, you can take care of yourself and then your family. And then when you realize that you, you've met all of your own needs, then you have this beautiful opportunity to take care of other people, um, to think about things in the future, whether it's your own family, maybe you want to put a kid through college or a grandchild through college, or maybe you just want to put a neighbor kid through college, like being able to do something cool, like put a neighbor kid through college, like that comes from building wealth. Um, and so just something I, I, I've struggled with personally that kind of climbed the socioeconomic ladder that perhaps maybe people are listening might, might think is, well, I, I have enough or I should stop or I shouldn't be greedy or wanting money is, is bad or evil or against my religion or all sorts of other things. But what if the idea that having more money meant that you could have more impact in the world, could that, could that fuel you to do more? It, it has fueled me. It has been a, a very powerful mindset shift for me. I love that so much because a lot of my audience are women that want to change the world. They're women That's that right. want to change their community. And it's the reason why I do what I do, because mm -hmm. I believe that sometimes we have negative examples of the alternative, right? Rich being greedy or not giving or hoarding. But what if we can change the narrative? That's right. We can be the example because I cannot think of better people to put money in the hands of than women physicians that want to change the world. That's right. That's, that's, absolutely what this, right. that's what this is about. We get to be the examples of what's possible. We get to change the narrative so that our kids and their kids and their kids will have the resources to create the world that we want to see. And my hope is that we all live it better than we mm -hmm. met it when we came here. So I love that you said that. That yeah. made me a little, yeah. give me some goosebumps right there. <laughs> <laughs> so thank you so very much for coming to hang out with me. It's been such a pleasure. I know you guys have enjoyed this because I have, I felt like I, I got a lot from this personally and I have no doubt that you guys are going to get a lot from it. So reach out to Elaine, reach out to her company. She has, it's a one-stop shop. And if you want help, whether you're a physician or not, reach out to her, diversify that income. It's that's what it's about. Let's get money in your pocket. All that's right, right, guys. Thanks for Thanks watching. Thanks everyone. <laughs> Bye.